Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. We're back for another episode of Fireside Chat, and as always, it's Dan and Matt with you. How you doing, Matt? Excellent. Why don't we uh, do something a little bit different this week? Let's start off our show not by talking about the Calgary Flames, but talking a little bit about the Adirondack Flames and what's going on in the AHL. Um, Matt, I know you and I have talked about this off the air, but there was a big announcement made just a little while ago that uh, the AHL is going to be changing some things around next year and essentially creating a new Pacific division for the 2015-2016 season, which means five NHL teams are going to be moving their affiliates. The Anaheim Ducks will be moving from Norfolk to San Diego. The Flames will be moving from Glen Falls to Stockton. The Oilers will move from Oklahoma City to Bakersfield. LA will move from Manchester to Ontario, California. And the San Jose Sharks will move from Worcester to San Jose. So really, they're creating a, a California division here of these five teams. And the reason it's important to Flames fans is that the Adirondack Flames are going to be relocating to Stockton, California. Um, we'd heard some rumors of this happening in the past, but were you expecting there's going to be five teams in, in California when this all shook down? Not really. I was actually kind of hoping that the entire Western Conference would have had their teams relocated to the western part of the country, so that way it would make things a little easier to separate. Yeah, I mean, they talked about doing some Texas teams. They talked about even maybe moving it to BC and, uh, you know, Washington and Oregon, that sort of thing. I was not expecting them all to be in California. But, you know, it to me it's kind of interesting. Like you said, move all the Western Conference teams. I've been thinking about, and you and I have talked about, I wonder if maybe there's a need for a second league there. Like in Major League Baseball, there's three or four um, AAA leagues. There's the you know um, International League. There's the Pacific Coast League. Maybe what they need to do is separate those teams. The Western Conference teams have the Western Conference affiliates who play in the West against each other. The Eastern Conference teams have the Eastern Conference affiliates who play in the East against each other. And they only ever meet for the Calder uh, Trophy. Yeah, I agree. And that would help to cut down on travel costs, difficulty with recalling players, and all that kind of fun. I think the other cool thing about it, too, is you'd really get to know the players in the West as a guy who's in the system. Because you'd be playing, I mean, even here, we're playing against familiar rivals. So, you know, these guys who are playing in this California division, the Pacific division of the A are going to see the same guys when they come to the NHL. So I think that would be probably a good thing, too, is to, to almost have Western players play Western players, Eastern players play Eastern players. And that way, as long as you don't get traded, you're coming up and creating rivalries right from the beginning. Yeah, and like if you look at the Adirondack Flames schedule, I think they've already played the Rochester Americans 10 times this season, and that's the Buffalo Sabres affiliate. Which, if once those players graduate to the NHL, they're not really going to see each other very much. Exactly. And it's weird already, too, because I guess the Pacific Division is going to play 60 games each next year, where the rest of the league is going to play, I think, 72 or 74. So even when we get to the playoffs, it's going to be weird, because these teams in the Pacific are going to have, you know, 12 to 14 less games than everybody else. And how does that weigh into really determining who's the best team? Where I think if we had two separate leagues, it'd be easier to make those kind of decisions. Yeah, exactly. And it's kind of an unfair competitive advantage for the new Pacific teams because of the fact that they will have played a, a dozen or so less games. Yeah, exactly. They'll be fresher. They'll have a lot less travel because they're all traveling just within the one state. Um, so I, I would not be surprised if next year we see a Pacific Division team go all the way to the Calder Cup, if not win it, just because I think they're going to be a lot fresher. And if I was any other AHL team, I'd be upset by that. Well, the thing is, is that the AHL actually wanted to mandate that all the teams play the same amount of games uh, because the weekday games are not exactly excellent draws for uh, ticket sales, but some of the larger markets like Chicago did not want to see themselves lose the revenue, and so that's why they kind of mixed it up. 
Yeah, I just think it's going to make for a weird competitive event, you know, a weird competitive landscape because, you know, if I were a team that had lost to in the playoffs, let's say to a Pacific uh, division team who had 12 less games than me, well, how do I feel? Mm -hmm, Exactly. And especially when it comes down to goaltending, the fresher goalie usually wins. And if the talent level's the same. So. It's not exactly fair what they're doing, but it's going to be interesting to see how they move, not necessarily next year, but beyond that, to see if they make adjustments to the schedule for that. Yeah, no, that's a good point, too. Hopefully this is just one year, but even then it's kind of that anomaly in the history books. Exactly. So the one thing that kind of frustrated me when I heard this, it seems like yet again, as we think we're getting a full-time home, the Flames move their affiliate. And if we look at the affiliates the team has had since uh, 2003, 2003 they left St. John uh, when they were the St. John Flames. They didn't have an affiliate f- from 2003 to 2005 when I think they were sharing, was it the Lock Monsters with yeah, uh, Lowell. the Hurricanes? Yeah, Lowell. And then in 2005, they introduced the Omaha Oxarban Knights, which I thought that Omaha would probably be a good market for them. Um, That was one of the coolest logos, I thought, because I always loved the way that they brought the Flaming Sea into the Knights' head. Yeah. And then they moved that team again right away to Quad Cities, and they became the Quad City Flames. Uh, then in, they were there from 2007 to 2009. Then 2009 through 2014, they were in Abbotsford. They moved in 2014 to Adirondack, where they'll stay for one season, and now they're moving to Stockton again. So it seems like the Flames are having a hard time finding a city they like. And I don't know about you, but I don't see a need to move the team that much. I mean, why can't we find a full-time home? Well, I think it comes down to finances and revenue. And, like, I know in Abbotsford, the main reason why they left was because Abbotsford uh, was getting a raw deal from the team, and they were getting, like, their taxpayers were having to foot a million dollars just to have the team there. Well, that was a bad deal in the first place. I mean, they're way out west from everybody else. True. And... uh, I don't know. It seems that it's more having to do with the finances and burning out a market rather than, you know what I mean? Like, it's just not stable. Yeah, well, and it surprises me, too, because, I mean, the Calgary Flames are a successful sporting organization. These guys own the Flames, the Hitmen, the Roughnecks, the Stampeders. They own pretty much all major sports in Calgary, so they know how to run a sports team. So you would think that a a group like that could go into a a smaller market like this and say, okay, we know how to do this. We know what we need to do here. And, you know, even before they move these teams, like it's almost like not enough scouting is being done or who knows what it is. You know, sometimes they're like in Quad City, there was a UHL team and ECHL team, I think. And then they moved to AHL. So I don't know if it's just underestimating the market, but those are all things that you think they would – spend a bit more time on because to me I hate the instability of and I imagine you know players and coaches do too of where am I going to be next year Mm-hmm. and like are you going to be playing in a bigger city a smaller city are you going to have to do a lot of travel or a little travel it's kind of a mess well, you know even the coaches and players find a place to live and then leaving mm-hmm. and I mean you know a place like um, Adirondack we know is a good hockey market the Phantoms have been there forever You know, the Red Wings had an affiliate there. So we know this market is a good hockey market. So I kind of feel like they're being cheated by the Flames by coming in for a year and then just taking off. Yeah. Well, at least the Adirondack will be getting Stockton's ECHL team. So they're not going to be completely without hockey. Yeah, it looks like a couple of teams are probably going to do that. Um, L.A. owns Ontario and Manchester, so probably swap them. Mm -hmm. Um, But... You know, even then, if I was living in Adirondack, I'd be kind of upset that I go from having an AHL team for however many years it's been to having an ECHL team. Like, there is a noticeable difference in the quality of hockey between the leagues. Oh, yeah. It's not a good thing, but unfortunately for the fans there, some hockey is better than no hockey, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, you're probably right. But, yeah, I I don't know. Maybe there's more to it that we don't know. I don't know if maybe the... 
Calgary Flames are hard to work with. Maybe they, because they are a big city, maybe they have a lot of demands that these smaller markets can't keep up with in terms of, you know, um, fitness center or what they expect for player accommodations. It just seems, it's, it almost seems like they just make mistakes too often or whatever it is, underestimating the market, burning them out, that they're not really learning from this. Like to move your team that many times since 2003 to have been in one, two, three, four, now five markets, it seems like there's got to be some underlying problem there. It could be. I don't have any details on that, so I have no... Yeah, I don't either. It's hard to say. It, I'm sure that there's a lot of factors that go into those kind of decisions, and unfortunately we don't have the access to know exactly why certain decisions were made. No, that's true. It's just, I guess, kind of frustrating when I look at you know, the movement of what's going on there and that sort of thing. It's like, come on, guys. We just found a new home, one that seems to be doing well. Why do we have to move again? It's kind of tiring for fans especially, much less, um, you know, the players and the coaches and the personnel. Oh, I know. Can you imagine, uh, say, like a guy like Ben Hanowski who's played in Abbotsford, moves over to Adirondack and... If he's with the Flames again next year, he'll be in Stockton and all playing for the same team per se, and yet three different cities. Yeah, well, I imagine there's also some people like coaches. I mean, our current coach wasn't in Abbotsford, but there's got to be some front office people, you know, with or even some of the older players with wives and kids, the same thing, where you're moving around. It's the same organization, but it's like you've been traded three times. Mm Mm-hmm. We'll see. Hopefully the Flames can stick in Stockton for a long time. Like, even five or six years would be a good break. (laughs) Well, you know, the fact that the AHL is creating this whole division around these five teams, I think that they're going to stay there for a while. Like, you know, I can't see them creating this and then two years later abandoning it. We'll see. (laughs) So I think we're we're definitely going to see these teams. And really, if you look around California, there's not many other hockey towns there, if you will. So I think that they'll either swap cities or we're going to see these teams in there for a long term. And if I was the HL commissioner and I was going to do something like this, I'd get a long-term commitment from the teams. Yeah. And hopefully more teams move out to the West so that way like you could have a Western conference and separate things a little easier. Yeah. Well, and, you know, it's... It's interesting because in in baseball, right, you have the different rules in the majors with the designated hitter and no designated hitter. But in hockey, there's no difference in rules between the West and the East. So I guess if you were to separate them into two leagues, the only advantage would just be that West plays West, East plays East, which I guess you could do within one league. But if you're going to segment them like that, I kind of like the idea of having two different leagues for that. Mm -hmm. They both have to be, you know, AHL quality. But, you know, I th- I don't know. I don't know where you'd get a second league from or who would start it. I imagine there's a lot of logistical issues around that. Yeah. So right now the Stockton team, the ECHL team that plays there is the Stockton Thunder. And we've seen that the Flames have actually registered a trademark for the name Stockton Grizzlies, though nothing has actually been finalized yet. Um, Do you think they'll stay with the Stockton Thunder name? I honestly don't know. I'm hoping that they have an interesting name and uh, like a completely different set of jerseys and kind of go away from the Adirondack Flames. See, I've never been a fan of a minor league team having the same name as their parent team. I think it's really uncreative and unoriginal. Um, you know, you look at even a team here in Calgary when we had our Pacific Coast League baseball team, the Calgary Cannons, and they switched affiliates all the time. You know, they were affiliated with Chicago, they were affiliated with Florida, they were affiliated with all different teams, but they were never the Baby Marlins or the, you know, Baby Mariners. And I liked that they had their own identity and their own color scheme, and you didn't have to have that rebranding if they changed affiliates. So. I really didn't like it when they did it in um, in Omaha, well, not Omaha, in Quad Cities, or when they did it in um, St. John and now in Adirondack. Even though it's kind of neat to see the throwback logo in Adirondack, I really hope they pick something different. Yeah, exactly. And with how things have been transitioning recently in the AHL, having a team named 
something other than the parent club would actually be beneficial from a marketing standpoint, so you're not having to rebrand constantly. Yeah, exactly. I I can see the Flames probably moving away from the Thunder name. They're probably going to want to put something new in place with new jerseys, that sort of thing. The Grizzlies is kind of a cool name. Yeah, that's because of the California state flag. It has an actual Grizzly on the state flag, so... It, with it, keeping with the flames having the state flags on the jerseys, it would kind of make sense to incorporate that into the team name. Would you want to see the farm team wear uh, black, red, and yellow, or would you want them to go in a completely different direction? Honestly, it would depend on what the fans would like. I don't have any preference if the flames want to go with something similar to abbotsford or adirondacks color schemes that's their prerogative if they want to go and create like a hunter green style jersey sort of similar to the minnesota wild go nuts right now the stockton thunders colors are black orange silver and white and i don't know to me i'd almost think if we're going to do it and we're going to separate ourselves, let's go all the way. You do see some AHL teams sometimes who have a completely different name but wear the parent club's jersey. And one of the things that I really liked in Abbotsford, or yeah, in Abbotsford, was that they wore the Flames jersey with different colors. If you remember, it was red and silver and black instead of red and yellow and black. So I kind of like that of taking the same template and putting your own color scheme into it. Yeah, and realistically, there's a whole host of different options if you decide to go with a completely local color scheme like you could uh, incorporate like because california has redwood trees you know that red color with the green perhaps who knows there's lots of different ways that you can go about it yeah for sure and you know i wonder if moving all these teams together is going to change a lot of the rivalries we see like you know, every year the Flames have their Penticton tournament, and last year the Jets were involved in that. But I wouldn't be surprised to see maybe in the Penticton tournaments the five Pacific AHL team teams that are now playing against each other so that the prospects all get to know each other and start AHL rivalries, and the you know NHL teams have a bit more of a rivalry. So I could definitely see that happening, of a little bit more of a tighter rivalry with some of these uh, other teams. True. Let's just hope that the AHL Flames, or whatever they're called out of Stockton, doesn't have the same problem the NHL Flames do, and that they can't win in San Diego, which will be the new Ducks Arena. Yeah. Burn that Honda Center down. <laughs> That's it. We, we don't need that curse in two cities. Well, Matt, while we're on the AHL topic, uh, why don't we talk a little bit about how the Adirondack Flames been doing? It's been a little while since we've talked Adirondack Flames. Um, we kind of have, I guess, two time periods lately. There was the without audio time period when audio was called up and then there's the um time after audio has been sent down and why don't we start with uh talking a little bit about how the flames were doing when they called audio up yeah once the flames recalled the on audio uh brad Thiessen went back in that as well as uh david carr and the flames lost four games in a row with like, they only played four times it, from the 9th to the 23rd. And each one of those games was a loss. And once Yanni Ordheo returned, uh, he got a 4-1 win, and then he won again in their most recent contest. You know, when I've watched Brad Thiessen this year, I mean, there's a reason he's a backup. Um, he just he doesn't look like a guy who can handle those kind of duties. He can do maybe one night here and there. But he always he always seems shaky to me. I'm always nervous anytime the puck comes near him because he he doesn't seem he's not a goalie I have confidence in. No, and realistically, there's a reason why he's bounced around the AHL. He's not a bad player. It's just he's a fill-in guy. He's not a guy that you're gonna look at as a potential NHL player. Yeah, for sure, and not a, a starting goalie even at the AHL level. He's 28. You know, by the time you're 28, if you're Still sitting in the AHL as a backup, you're probably not coming to the NHL. There's always some exceptions to that, but you're probably not coming to the NHL. Yeah, like Rob Zepp um, this year for the Flyers, as an example. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I mean, one of the nice things about Thiessen is he does have playoff experience. He's made several appearances with the Wilkes-Barre Scranton Penguins. Um, but, yeah, he just he seems to me like a guy who 
I'm glad that was a backup because it means that we don't have a young guy sitting as the backup not playing a lot of games, but he's almost the Curtis McElhaney of Flames AHL goalies, the guy who, you know, when you put him in, you're not sure what you're going to get, but you know it's generally not going to be a great performance. True. And what's his, uh, how many wins does he have? I have no idea off the top of my head. I'll go take a look. But yeah, so when it's just uh, one of those things that with uh, both Mason McDonald and uh, Jonathan Gillies in other leagues, there's nobody that's right ready to be in the AHL right at this second. And so that's the reason why we have a couple of fill-in guys. And, you know, I'm okay with that. Like, I don't want a young guy sitting idle on the bench playing 10 games a year. So... To me, if, you know, when they decide they want to move somebody else into the AHL, if they're going to play in the flame system, we have to do something with Ordeo. We can't just keep them there. Oh, no. We'll likely have to have Ordeo playing in Calgary next year right from the get-go because if we sign, say, Jonathan Gillies out of Providence, he's going to need to be the starter in the AHL. And Mason McDonald can return back to the queue for another season the, when I saw when Ordeo got called up that they brought Doug Carr um, in to be the backup I was hoping we were going to get to see a start from him because you and I saw Doug Carr at the training camp in the summer well he did he actually did get a start in oh did he I didn't that must have been the one game I didn't watch yeah okay and so, he lost that one okay <laughs> so there you go so there was a couple games I didn't watch in that period so yeah, we both, I think, really liked Doug Carr when we saw him in the summer. He looked okay, but a little in over his head in the one game. All right, whether that's nerves or whatever, who knows. Yeah, it's it's a different level for him. Um, you know, I, I think we also have to remember that in the summer, he was looking better than McDonald at some point. So, you know, we saw the best of him, and... I imagine it would be hard to step into a team he hasn't been with, jump into that net, not know the tendencies of the defensemen, that sort of thing. Oh, yeah, and it takes a while to adjust and get your bearings, especially when you're playing against the league that you're not familiar with, you you don't know the other shooters, anything. Yeah. Where they like to take shots, that whole thing. So it does take a little while to adjust. Yeah, for sure. So now we, we're we seeing the, the Adirondack Flames back doing fairly well again. Um, they haven't played yet in February, but if you look at they they came off. You're right. They've played the Cana- the Rochester Americans so much. Um, they had a 4-1 win against the uh, Americans on the 24th, and they've pretty much been off since then, which, as we were mentioning earlier, most of the games in the AHL are on the weekends. Um, but fairly good month of actually – they had a lot of losses in January, but I thought a fairly good month of hockey. I watched most of the games there. Um, they're probably going to struggle going into February with a bunch of their top players recalled. Do you think that's going to affect them a bit? Well, not only that. The Flames play uh, the Utica Comets three times and the Oklahoma City Barons twice, and those two teams are two of the and top. And those are both back to back. Yeah, and they're the top teams in the league pretty much or our conference anyway and we've struggled mightily against Utica I don't think they've won a game out of the seven six or seven times they've played already so it'll be a tough month just like Calgary it'll be a bit of a challenge yeah it's got to be tough being an AHL GM because you never know who you're going to have day to day Mm-hmm. You know, players come up, players come down. You never know who's going to be where. Um, it was funny because there was a media availability the other day for the Calgary Flames, and they the media was talking to Sam Bennett, who's now healthy um, and, well, not healthy, but skating again, ready to be back on the ice. And um, they were asking questions of, you know, some of the system, some of the guys in the office as to, hey, where do you think he's going to go to? And assistant general manager um, Brad Pascal, who's also in charge of Adirondack, says, I really hope he comes down to the AHL for a bit for a conditioning stint because they could probably really use a top scorer like that. 
Yeah, and I think that's one of the reasons why at the All-Star break they sent Ordeo down and kept them there yeah. was to... Because the Adirondack was kind of sliding out of the playoff picture. And, you know, the management likely would like to see them actually in the playoffs just to get that experience. So, you know, it, as good as Ordeo played you have to weigh the benefits of the entire organization more so than the one guy. Exactly. Especially when you're in a in a team like the Flames who said that this is a developmental, you know, team. They want to actually make this a competitive developmental system. Um which not everybody says that they want, but yeah, you definitely then have to say, okay, we gotta look at what's the best for the HL team. Mm-hmm. Some systems they just say we don't care if they win or lose, we just want the guys down there playing hockey. Right now at Arondack six sits sixth um, in the regular season stats. They're sixth in the in the league right now, and they are right behind. Yeah, you're right. Oklahoma City's first. Uh, Utica's up there as well. Adirondack has 44 games played, 24 wins, 16 losses, three overtime losses, and one shootout loss. So doing really well. Oh yeah, they're points. doing excellent. It's just it's better to make sure they can cement the playoff spot before too long, anyway. Yeah, and and I you know I really think I mean last year we saw a bunch of the AHL players come up after the deadline here in Calgary. I think that depending on where both teams are sitting, we may not see that this year. We might see you know all the players that are in the AHL stay there if they're making a playoff run. Exactly, and you would probably want to send a few of the guys that are sitting in the press box like Grandland and Berchi down if everybody else is healthy just to allow for Adirondack to be competitive in the stretch run. Exactly, especially if the Flames are in a playoff position come trade deadline. I think you're going to see that they're not going to want to have some of the call-up guys they have here um, staying up, they're going to say, okay, we need a strong roster of, you know, however many guys, 24, to make the run. Mm-hmm. So we'll see. It'll be interesting to see. But, yeah, the HL news was the biggest thing, I think, that's happened in the Flames world in the last little bit. So I thought we should probably lead with that. Mm-hmm. Um, and we haven't touched on Adir- how Adirondack's doing since December, so it's good to – get back in the swing of things on that note yeah did you see the game they played with the pink jerseys oh yeah uh, those were actually kind of sharp i was watching it and when i heard that it was going to be pink jersey night i was expecting some sort of monstrosity because we've seen pictures so was I. <laughs> from other teams where they've gone all pink it's like camo nights in the ahl they always look horrible and i thought it was interesting they came out with a different design they didn't just make the current jersey pink yeah, it was actually a pink stripe right around the logo. It almost looked the, like a Canadian's jersey in pink. Yeah, that, that's a good comparative. Yeah. It, it was actually not bad. No, and it was it was a white jersey, and the numbers were white on pink, which at first I thought was kind of weird with a black name. But, yeah, it was it was unique for sure. And when I was watching the game, I, I was thinking at the, fr- at the beginning, wow, this is going to look horrible. And then you get into it, it's like, it's not that bad. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it was... If you haven't seen them, you can go on the website, uh, AdirondackFlames.com, and they have some pictures of those jerseys. Yeah, so we like pink jerseys on Fireside Chat, apparently. So <laughs> At least, well, that pink jersey, at least. Yes. There's been some horrible <laughs> ones that we've seen in the past. Oh, yeah. So if anyone wants an Adirondack Flames jersey, now's the time to go online and buy it, because next season they're going to be collector's items. So get your get your Adirondack jersey now if you want it. Um, get your favorite player on it. I imagine if you get it with Ordeo's name on it, it could be worse than in a couple of years. Well, Matt, let's move back to the NHL then, back to the Calgary Flames, and look at the three games that they've played since we talked last. Um, we had kind of an interesting week of games since we talked last. The Flames played uh, Buffalo, where they won 4-1. to one. They played the um, Wild, where they won one, or they lost one nothing. They played Edmonton, where they won four to four to two, and then they played Winnipeg, where they won five to two. Um, thoughts on those games? 
I thought they actually played exceptionally well in each of those games, and it's actually kind of interesting that both the Edmonton game and uh, the Winnipeg game, those were both 60-minute efforts. Even though the Oilers got up to nothing in the early going, it, both of the plays were just kind of right off the face-off, bang, it's in the net. And it's not like the Oilers had any sustained pressure at all through the entire 60 minutes. And it's good to see that the Flames are stretching it out. Instead of just playing 20 minutes, they're coming for the entire game. Yeah, see, I was at the Oilers game. I agree with you that it wasn't like the Oilers had sustained pressure, but I felt like in the first period at least, the Flames could have put on more pressure. Um, it did feel like they maybe came out a little bit underestimating the Oilers, and that's partly why I think the Oilers were able to get up early. Yeah, it's one of those things. It is Edmonton, and you know, as long as you actually put any effort in, you'll likely come away with the two points. And I was I was sitting at that game watching the score, and you know, really none none of the Flames' offense came till the very end, and I was sitting there thinking. Uh, after the Buma goal, the first one, this thing's going overtime. And, yeah. you know, then we had the Monaghan goal and Buma scored again to get the regulation win. And boy, did that ever fire up the Sal Dome. I think for, of the games I've been to this year, that was the most fired up I've seen the Dome. Yeah. I wasn't there, unfortunately, so I don't know about that. And then, really, the Minnesota game was nothing to write home about. That was a pretty boring game, the way I see it. Oh, yeah. The. Uh, they just couldn't seem to get anything going. And that happens once in a while. You run into a goalie that's on his game, and Devin Dubnik has played well this year. So, you know, and that's good for him, getting out of Edmonton and actually salvaging an NHL career. Yeah, well, and we talked about this last week um, when we were on when we were guest hosting um, on the other podcast we mentioned last week, but... There's a lot of guys who leave Edmonton and end up having a better career. It's you know, and I think goalies especially, um, we're going to see more of that. I think even when um, the current goaltenders get out of there, we'll see some of that too. Mm-hmm. What did you think about the Winnipeg game last night? I thought it was actually one of the one of, if not the best and most entertaining sixty minutes of hockey that the Flames have played all season. They were engaging physically. They weren't. You know, Winnipeg's a bigger team, and they were taking it to them physically. Gaudreau actually almost knocked a guy over. He actually threw a hit, which is, you know, like, whoa. (laughs) Yeah, no, I I saw that one too. And, you know, it's good to see. In the Edmonton game, we had two fights in that game that were pretty much back-to-back, like within a few seconds of each other. And, you know, it's like, wow, we had Bow League fight, and then we had England fight, and wow, these guys are finally fighting. Like We haven't seen a lot of that this season. And I feel like since those fights, the team has been playing more um, more physical. We saw it in the rest of the Edmonton game. And you're right, we saw it in the Winnipeg game. And I like the fact that the Flames were able to come back in the Winnipeg game early. It didn't take till the third and late in the third to do that. And I think that was a showing a really good 60-minute effort there as well. Mm-hmm. And it's actually kind of interesting that the presence of David Wolf in the Edmonton game sparked Bolig and England to both drop the mitts. It's a good point. Yeah, that was uh, that was David Wolf's first NHL appearance, and I was watching him closely in that game, and he was he was a better NHL. Well, I guess one game's hard to say this about, but he had a better NHL appearance than I thought he was going to. Yeah. Uh, he- I thought through the first two periods, he was probably the Flames' best player, which is actually kind of surprising. Yeah, I don't know if I'd go that far, but he definitely looked like he belonged on the team. He looked like a guy who knew what he was expected to do and, you know, wanted to get into the play and that sort of thing. Um, I don't know if I'd go as far as saying he was the best, but, yeah, he definitely, he didn't didn't have a slow start to that game. Mm Mm-hmm. And speaking of uh, Wolf, we also got to see Sven Berchi in the Winnipeg game because um, we we had a, a sick Michael Backlund. What what was your thought on Sven Berchi in that game? 
I thought he that was probably his best game of the season, and he was the reason why the Flames took the lead in the second period when uh, Mark Scheifele passed the puck to the blue line and it went into the neutral zone. Berchi kind of cut off the defenseman coming back, giving Mason Raymond that extra couple of seconds to collect the puck and then fire it in on net. And if the defenseman wasn't impeded a little bit, I don't think that Raymond might have got off the shot that he did. Yeah, I agree. I think that in that game, and I was only watching it, you know, I, I only saw it on TV, um, but I think that if you look at what we saw of Sven Berchi there, it seemed like the most complete game from him that we've seen. We've seen him go out there and look lost in some games. We've seen him play a little bit more defensively in some games, a little bit more offensively in some games. To me, this was uh, the complete player that I would expect he would be with where he was drafted and what's been expected of him by the organization. Yeah, and I'll be curious to see if he suits up again against the Sharks. I think that he played well enough that he possibly should get another appearance. We'll have to see. Yeah. But, yeah, his play was actually really good, and if he continues to play like that, he will definitely get opportunities to play in the top nine. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I think that he's definitely showing, or at least in that game, showing better than he has all year, and I think management probably would want to put him out again before somebody else because there's they they need to see what they've got in him and you know how things are coming along and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but and he it, it was promising well. what we saw at least. Yeah, and he has played well since he went back to Adirondack before this recall and he's been at one of Adirondack's top players so him coming up and performing well last night is a good thing yeah it's it's showing well i think whatever was in his head before this about being an adirondack and seeing that as a demotion it seems like he's got that out of his head and he can actually just go play hockey the way that he can play hockey now yeah and hopefully he's turned the corner like uh, i know a guy in toronto nazima kadri kind of had went through the exact same situation of getting bounced up and down before cementing himself in the NHL full-time. So hopefully Sven can turn the corner and become that caliber of player for Calgary instead of getting bounced all over the place. Let's hope so. I was also glad to see in the the Jets game two Flames get their first goals of the year. We had uh, Diaz get a power play goal, and we also had Bolig score a goal. So I thought, you know, you know it's a complete team effort when you've got two guys who are getting their first goals of the year. Yeah. By that or a bad I, goalie, one of the two. Yeah. I thought uh, Rafael Diaz has played probably his best hockey as a Calgary Flame in the last couple of weeks. Honestly, it, when Smeed gets healthy, I don't think that you would take Diaz out of the lineup considering how well he's been playing. Well, and for a guy who really... I mean, he wasn't even signed as a UFA. He was invited to training camp, I think, almost to fill space because we're short on, you know, quality defensemen in the system. Um, And to win that job out of camp, I don't think much was expected of him this year. I know we weren't expecting much of him, and I agree with you. He seems like he's finally getting the chance to shine, which I don't think he's had really before this, and probably making a, a case for himself to either be here or somewhere else in the NHL next year. But yeah, I'm liking what I see. doesn't look like just a seventh fill-in defenseman right now. Yeah, and that's the thing with the Flames system is that it allows the defensemen especially to utilize their offensive assets effectively. And we're seeing how guys like Giordano, Brody, and Russell especially have responded to that. And we're allowing a guy like Diaz who hasn't really had a huge amount of opportunities in other teams beyond being a depth defenseman to show what he can do. And hopefully that will allow him either to be retained by Calgary or to at least get another opportunity somewhere else, perhaps in a larger role. 
I, if I were a GM, I probably wouldn't bring him in in much more than a depth role. I think, you know, even in a 5-6 role, he'd be fine. But I don't think he's a guy that I'd be looking at as a 3-4 guy. At least not yet. Oh, yeah. I agree. It's just that he might get the opportunity to do that if he continues his level of play through the remainder of the season. Yeah, well, I think, you know, if nothing else, when it's time for negotiations next year, whether it's here or somewhere else, he'll be back on the north side of a million-dollar contract. True. And he will likely get a job somewhere instead of going back to Europe. Yeah, or even, you know, probably worrying, as he did this year, of training camps are opening and nobody wants me. What do I do? Mm Mm-hmm. Two other... Two other flames I wanted to point out that I think have been looking really good lately, and we talked about Lance Buma last week, but uh, Paul Byron finally broke his dry spell against the Oilers, scoring the first goal in the third period. But even in that game, Buma chalked up two more goals. I think these are two guys that we're seeing exceptional seasons from, um, seasons that weren't expected from Buma especially. I think Byron has been up and down, but... As a as a depth forward, I think Byron's looking good right now. He's doing more than I expect him to, anyways. Yeah, and Lance Bomo was honored with the uh, Molson Cup for January as the Player of the Month, so that was nice to see. And he's been exceptional. And whether it's a short term hot streak or something more, we'll have to see. But uh, how can you not like what Lance Boma is bringing to this club? I can't remember the Lance the last time I saw Lance Boma have a bad game. Like I'm I'm going back through games that I'm remembering this season. I can't think of a time he looked terrible. No. And he is really solidifying himself as one of the best fourth line players in the entire NHL. If I were Trilivian, I would want to go lock this guy up long term. Oh, so would I. At least four or five years. Exactly. And it's going to be cheap, and you can get them for four or five years. Why not? Yeah. Like, even if you're signing them for around $2 million, for what he brings to the club, that's well worth it. Not $2 million a year. You're saying $2 million for the whole contract? No, $2 million a year. Oh, really? Okay. I think that would be a bit expensive, but... Well, you got to remember, that would be buying a couple of years of his UFA status, and... Uh, a guy like Brandon Prust, I think, is getting like 2.7. Okay. So Then, yeah, if Prust is getting 2.7, then maybe that's doable. Do you think that Paul Byron, right now I think he's he's looking better than I thought he would all season. I didn't think that Byron would stay with the team all year, um, just from what we've seen in the past, and he has. He hasn't been the offensive player that I think he would like to be this year. But to me, he's never, just like Boomer, he's never looked really terrible to me for more than you know, more than one game at a time. He's had some bad games, but he always seems to bounce back. Do you think that Paul Byron has a legitimate place in this organization going forward after this year? As a short-term thing, probably. I don't know what... The problem is, is that with so many good young forwards in the Flame system that eventually you're going to have to lose players like... Guys like Glenn Cross, Raymond, Stage, and all the veteran guys uh, because of the fact that we need those roster spots. And Paul Byron might end up being one of the casualties to that. I don't know what it is with him in breakaways. Like, either he's not thinking enough on, on how to pull the moves. Or he's or overthinking he's, them. Yeah, and... It just looks like some he's doing something either too mar- much or too little, and when he gets those opportunities, and he's just he just needs to be himself and just go with the flow instead of he kind of freezes when he's on the breakaways, and it's unfortunate because he gets so many opportunities, and like if he even capitalized on a third of those opportunities, he'd be one of the top five or six point getters for the flames for sure and i think that's the biggest thing for me is that this guy's getting opportunity he knows how to get himself in front of the net with a puck but he can't capitalize on it when he does and if i'm the coach looking long term i might look at someone like granlin who can do that and we've seen that 
and maybe look at that Ross spot and say, you know, maybe I give it to Granlin. I really think that Byron is going to be one of the first casualties here. I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see him suit up as a flame opening day next year. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, it's one of those things that uh, it's up to the players and their level of play to determine the spots. And if he picks it up in the next 20 games, 30 games, and cements himself a, as a quality player, then, you know, you take him into training camp next year and you see. If he continues with not capitalizing on his offensive chances, then perhaps you look elsewhere. And Byron is in the last year of his deal. He's making $600,000 this year, and he's an RFA in the summer. So the Flames would have a little bit of um, a little bit of leeway there as far as what they want to do. They could always retain him and not bring him to Calgary, have him play somewhere else. Um, but I, I don't know about you. I think if he's here, we know that he can't clear, clear or he's not uh, waiver exempt. So if he has to clear waivers, I don't think he will. So I think if you bring him back next year, he's got to be in the NHL. Well, the thing is, is that in training camp, a lot of players that are at the level of Paul Byron do get waived to their respective farm teams. So if you're doing it right in the middle of all of that, I think you could probably get Byron through. Like, I didn't expect Jakob Markstrom for Vancouver to not get claimed, and yet yeah. he managed to squeak through. No, that's true. If you do in the middle of camp, you can probably do it. But if he's like your last cut, I think you'll lose him. Yeah. We'll see. It, it's up to... That's the thing that I love about this coaching staff and the organizational philosophy is if you're doing well... Then you got a spot. If you you're not, you get cut, and it's up to the players themselves to say I'm staying in Calgary or I'm going elsewhere. Well, and I, I like too that that bar is shifting throughout the season. It's not just him saying I want to do better. It's I have to do better than this guy who's now doing better than he was last week. True. You know, as we're seeing guys like Juris and Granlin and and even Berchi come up. You know, I think that bar is being changed every week as far as who's here, who's not. I mean, you know, as far as I can remember, we've had more guys, quality guys in the Flaming Sea on the forward side this year than we have before because they're bringing them up and down as they get hot and cold. Yeah. So, you know, it's not like it's just, okay, you got to beat Setaguchi for a spot, which many of these guys have done now. Seto has gone. Um, but now it's, okay, you got to be better than this guy we just called up as well. Yeah, and then, then you get a guy like David Wolf coming in, and he provides something a little bit different than any of the other guys because of his physicality. So, you know, it yeah, it all uh, you know, it depends on who's doing what and again, it's up to the players. Well, and so. you know, I think that's an interesting thing too when you mention that. I've noticed that over the last little bit cuz I've been thinking about it, but in the past, it seems like when we brought up players from the farm, they've tried to emulate the guy that they were being brought up to replace. We've seen that a lot in the past. If you know, okay, um, Conroy's hurt, so I'm going to come up and try to play like Conroy. And what I like is every guy that we brought up this year, to me anyways, seems in the seems more so than in the past, like they have their own identity and they're playing just their game and staying to that. Mm-hmm. Like you saw in the Oilers game, Wolf, he would be behind the net protecting the puck and engaging physically and winning the puck battles, where a guy like, say, Sven Berchi, he's more cerebral and not so physical. Yeah. So, you know, it just depends on what they're bringing, and if it's a positive thing, they'll play. If not, then... Back to Adirondack you go. Well, I think that's the cool thing, too, is with so many guys that are waiver-exempt, we can bring up the right piece we need depending on who we're playing that night. You know, it made sense to me to put Wolf in against Edmonton because we know that game's probably going to be more physical, but perhaps not against the Jets. But maybe it makes sense to put him back in in one of the two games against the Sharks that's coming up. True. Hopefully his leg is healed enough in time for that. Yeah. He got... He got cut with a skate in the Oilers game, and he missed the entire third period. Yeah, I saw the replay of that, and I haven't heard anything as far as where he's at or how many stitches he got or anything like that. Yeah, but it looked serious enough where he'll probably miss the next week or so before getting back at it. 
Well, talking about players that have been hurt, uh, Sam Bennett's back practicing with the team. He's been on the ice before this, but now he's doing full team practices, still in the non-contact jersey, but looks like he's close to being ready. The question that everybody's asking, and I want to know what you think, is what do you do with Bennett when he's ready? Do you play him in the NHL? Do you send him to the AHL for a conditioning stint? Or do you send him right back to the OHL? I would send him to Adirondack just to get an idea where he's at in terms of his level of play. It doesn't hurt anything to for him to get that experience. And if he's playing well enough, recall him to Calgary. If not, send him back to the OHL. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I think that gives us the most flexibility. Um, I'm just reading the rules here around a conditioning loan. So unless a player consents, he shall not be loaned on a conditioning loan to a minor league club. Such conditioning loan shall not exceed more than 14 consecutive days. So we can send him to the AHL for two weeks. Now, you know, the AHL, that's probably going to mean maybe two, maybe four to six games in that time. But I agree with you. I think that's enough to figure out where he's at, what that shoulder's looking like. And I don't think there's any reason to bring him up here. I would be okay burning a contract here and send him back to the O. Well, the thing is, is that if he is goes to say he gets sent to Adirondack and he instantly becomes the best guy on the team, well, you would be kind of stupid to waste that player for the playoff run. Yeah. You know, and if he can come up after the conditioning stint and take a top six spot like Gaudreau and perform, then why not? It's not going to hurt anything. Like, okay, yeah, you burn a year on his contract, but you're getting the benefit of, like, a trade deadline acquisition yeah, but that if you he, get to keep. But if he goes to the AHL and he doesn't look like he's ready to play yet because he's been out for so long, I see no reason to rush him up here. It's not like we need oh, the no. marketing behind it of, look, he's here. I'd say, you know what, send him to the O. Let him play a couple more games there at a lower pace. Get that conditioning back, and we'll see you in September. Yeah, exactly. And like, if he comes into Adirondack and plays just okay, then yes, yeah, ship him back to the OHL. Let him go on a playoff run down there and have fun. Right now, he's wearing training cap number sixty-three, and as we all know, he's worn ninety-three in the OHL in honor of Doug Gilmore. Uh, when he becomes a Flame here full time, would you rather see him wear ninety-three for Gilmore or the or the Flames version of that, which would be thirty-nine? Honestly, as long as he wears one of those numbers, I would be pleased. Like, I don't want to see him ha- having to adhere to the under 35 rule that Burke has. I think that, like, if you're a top player that you can do what you want. And, like, Gaudreau, for example, he always wore the number 13, so that made sense. But, you know, Bennett, he's always worn 93 in his OHL years. So if he wants to do that or wear 39, either is good by See, me. to me, I'm not a fan of the you're a, you're a star player so you should be treated differently than everybody else if there's a rule like that. Um, I think that they need to come up with a rule and stick to it. And knowing Berkey and how he seems to hate high numbers and the fact we're running out of numbers anyways, I can see them increasing the limit to, to 40 from 35 and then he'll wear 39 because that sits in there. Yeah. I think it also makes sense for him to wear Gilmore's number in Calgary. It's not retired. It's not honored as a forever aflame. To me, it's fair pickings for anybody. Yeah. Though I, unlike Brian Burke, am a fan of high numbers. I like guys that wear kind of odd numbers, numbers that we don't see all the time. Um, you know, guys that wear numbers in the 90s, guys that wear numbers in the you know 70s, 80s, that sort of thing. I think that's kind of cool. So I, I wouldn't be opposed at all to him wearing 93. Mm-hmm. I don't really care. Uh, you know, honestly, if you're playing well, it doesn't really, in my mind, matter what number you're wearing. So, Just as an interesting trivia tidbit, there's only been two Flames in history that have worn a number in the 90s. We had Michael Nylander wore number 92 for most of his career. Actually, I think his whole career here. And Matt, can you tell me who wore number 93 in the past? Uh, Mike Camilleri. Mike Camilleri, when we reacquired him. Uh, 13 wasn't available. I think Jokinen was wearing it, wasn't he? Yes. 
So he wore 93 for a season. I remember our, our former co-host, Luke, hated seeing that banner of him at the Dome that made him so upset wearing 93. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I'd be okay either way, but I have a feeling it's going to end up being 39. Yeah. Better than we'll 63, see. though. I don't want him to keep that number. We'll see. Anything else you want to talk about, uh, Flames news-wise, before we predict next this coming week? Uh, no, I'm good. It's been kind of a slow week for the Flames, just some games, but not a lot of big news. Um, that's why we thought we'd look at the AHL stuff, which we've been pushing off for a while. Now it's finally confirmed. We're sandwiched between two home games right now. We had the Jets in town last night, and tomorrow night the San Jose Sharks visit the Dome. On Friday, we finish the homestand as the Pittsburgh Penguins come to town. And then we have the Sharks again on the road next Monday. So we've got six points on the table, uh, two games against the Sharks, and one against the Penguins. How do you think we're going to do? I think we'll split the Sharks, and I think we'll probably end up losing to the Penguins. So you think we'll get two points? Yeah. Yeah. Which game, do you have any any thoughts on which Sharks game we're going to win? I, it could be either. I'm, I'll am i go with the home game, just for simplicity. I agree with you. Um, I think we can beat the Sharks at home, because the Flames are doing quite well now. I definitely think they're going to lose the Penguins. I hope they prove me wrong, but I think the Penguins are going to overpower them. And I think it's going to be tough to regroup in time to see the Sharks again. The Sharks were a fairly physical team, and I think they're going to take a lot out of the Flames tomorrow night. And I think it's going to take a little bit for this team to get ready and get you know back to being able to win. Um, and I don't think it's going to happen by Monday. Yeah. A lot of fun games this month, eh? <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, and, and as we said, this is the tough month for the Flames. This is the make-or-break month. You know, after that, we got the Kings and the Canucks and the Bruins. So the Flames have to figure this out. And I think the fact that we have so many forwards who we can carry and swap in and out is going to be a definite asset. I agree. Because I think we're we're going to see guys get hurt. We're going to see guys come out of this month not ready to play and you know not being in the lineup. So I think the fact we know we've got so many of these guys, we're going to see a lot of change. Yeah, and the fact that the Flames are being decimated by the flu at the moment and – also getting injured just from the nature of play like David Wolf uh, we're gonna probably end up seeing uh, all the players that have been recalled at some point in the next week or two and hopefully they get some quality time and can contribute and when I look at the schedule for this month every team we're playing has a very different identity you know LA plays very differently in Boston who plays very differently in the Rangers so I think there's going to be a lot of options, even outside of injury, to slot the right guys into the right opponents here. Mm-hmm. You know, some It'll of the, definitely some of these games, be a learning experience for the team and how adaptable they are. Yeah, and, and I think it's also a way to keep guys healthy. You know, If you're saying to the coach, hey, coach, I had a rough night, okay, we'll let you sit for one and rest. And that's an option not a lot of teams want to do. How many teams feel confident with, say, five call-up guys? I know. It's so nice to actually have guys that you can recall and they'll step in and be great. (laughs) Yeah, well, that's it. Guys you have confidence in. You know, I can recall this guy and have confidence he's going to play the way I need. Not, oh, crap, I need a recall. Who's the the best of the worst? Exactly. Which in in the past, we've recalled guys and it's like, who is this guy? And, you know, just hope he doesn't stink up the joint. Yeah, and put him on the fourth line, let him play five minutes, and just hope that the other team doesn't score three or four times while he's out there. Exactly. As long as his plus minus is zero at the end of the night, he's had a good game. Um, But, yeah, I think it's going to be quite an interesting month. A lot of dynamic teams are playing, and it'll be interesting to see what the Flames do there. Some of these games, I can see wanting David Wolf in the lineup. Some of them I can see wanting some more speed and putting some like Berchi or Granlin in. Um, and that's going to make a tough month for Adirondack too because they're probably going to be changing their personnel every every week or so at the same time. Yeah. 
Fun times. Yeah, so... It's nice to see games that actually matter in February. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And uh, it's been... Uh, gotta be the three, maybe four seasons now, where by this point we knew we were out. Yeah. Do you think, Matt, that sometime this month, let's say sometime in the next... Well, let's let's say by the 11th, um, which is right before the LA Kings game, do you think we're going to see any major personnel changes as the trade deadline looms? Probably not. I think they'll cut it closer to the actual trade deadline. I could see the Flames can trading off some players, but it, it would basically be veteran depth guys, not anybody like Hoodler or Weidman or anything like that. Yeah, the only deal I can see getting done early is if somebody's goalie goes down, you got to jump on that market opportunity. Yeah. You know, if somebody loses a goalie in the next week and they call about Ramo and there's a good deal, you send them out of town. Yeah, but, uh, exactly. Like if, say, like the Islanders lose Halak for a few weeks, they don't really have a backup that's any good. So, Yeah, otherwise I be... can't see any team really needing to get a deal done with us early except for that one. Yeah, and I think you just let it rip for the remainder of the month and see how things are in March and hopefully some deals come around and we see. Well, I think that until we get to the last week of this month, like the, you know, Rangers devils game, we're really not going to know where we're going to be in the standings either. And if we're want to going to sell a bit more, or buy a bit more. True. So I, and I don't want to make like those decisions if, if too the, early. Yeah. Like if the flames are saying 10th or 11th at the end of the month, then you know, if somebody wants guys like Stajan, Jones, like all the depth guys, fine, bye, see you later. Yeah. And because the Flames are likely going to be out of it by then and just run with the kids after that. Yeah, I don't think that we're in any position, no matter what happens this month, to go into wholesale selling mode. But yeah, I agree with you. Maybe there's a couple more for sale signs out if we're out by the end of this month. Mm-hmm. And if we're in, we might be instead looking to add a piece or two from somebody. Oh, I don't think that they'll go that far unless the player can contribute for the long term. Well, I don't think but... you're going to do a rental, but I definitely see if they're in the playoffs adding something somewhere. Possibly. I can I can see trading a goalie for a 3-4 defenseman or something like that. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see. But, yeah, I, th I think unless somebody comes calling for a goalie, we're not going to see much movement till the end of this month. No, and that's fine. Uh, uh, you got to let the players, you know, define what the season will be. Yeah. And, you know, they've done a great job thus far. Let's see how it goes. Well, that's it. You almost got to ride these guys because they've got you this far. There's no point in making a change now. Yep. All right, well, Matt, you have a good week. Let's hope that we're both wrong and we get more than two points this week. Yes, and thanks for listening, everybody, and have an excellent, awesome week. We will see you next week as hopefully it's not a week of gloom and we'll have some excitement to talk about. Yes. Go Flames, go. That's right. Have a great week. Fireside Chat is edited by Mike Crosby and Brett Bauer. This show is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license information, visit firesidechat.ca.